Hi, we took a little departure uh, from the normal Wednesday at 2 p.m. slot, and we're coming uh, to you live now, uh, live with Bottleneck, uh, where we help stop the bottleneck in your business and in your life. My name is Jamie Jam, the host, and I have Phil Singleton on today, who is, I can't, can't even begin to describe him, but I'm going to here in just a moment, so bear with us. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on LinkedIn, wherever you're watching this, um, if it's live, ask us questions. That's what we're here for. I really want to be able to, especially having Phil here, the guy's freaking brilliant. He can answer amazing questions based on his um, true experience. So um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into this thing. We'll get it rock and rolling. If you're seeing this in an evergreen form, meaning you're seeing it after it's been recorded, Still comment and ask questions or whatever you'd like, and I'll make sure to get those off to Phil so that we can get you sorted. All right, so let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Uh, we'll get started here in 43 seconds. My name is Jamie J, host of Live with Bottleneck, where we help stop the bottleneck in your business, your life. And today I'm proud to welcome somebody I've known for about, I don't know, three, four, maybe five years, Phil Singleton. We're going to be talking about how to create a seven digit EBITDA agent. He's the founder and CEO of Kansas City Web Design and SEO. Um, he is absolutely amazing. But why, oh, why can Phil help you stop the bottleneck in your business? Let me tell you, Phil is a Google marketing and SEO expert. And when I say an expert, if there's a higher level than an expert, that's him. He's a web designer and award-winning author. Since 2005, Phil has owned and operated a digital agency based in Kansas City, just about two and a half, three hours north of me. In 2016, Phil and John Jantz of Duct Tape Marketing co-wrote the best-selling SEO book, SEO for Growth, the ultimate guide for marketers, web designers, and entrepreneurs. SEO for Growth is an Amazon bestseller and has been listed as a top marketing book by Mashable, Oracle, and the Huffington Post. It's also been featured <clears throat> excuse me, on MSNBC, Entrepreneur, and Search Engine Journal, and was named by Forbes as the number one SEO book on its list of essential SEO books for every startup to read. Phil is also the author of a popular WordPress SEO plugin that helps power the SEO rankings for over 60,000 websites worldwide. Phil's latest startup venture, Podcast Bookers, is a service that helps marketers and executives get booked on established podcasts, <coughs> excuse me, as a way to generate expertise, authority, and trust. I'm having a rough time here coughing, so I'm going to put it back to us and get Phil on so that he can talk to you while I get a sip of water. Great. Go for it. Hey, uh, Jamie, so great to be here. Um, I couldn't have had a better intro if I you know, had written it myself, <laughs> <laughs> which is what, you know, kind of what we do on some of these for in, in the podcast booking agency that we do is you're, you're setting these things up and th through one sheets, when you pitch, you know, third parties on established podcasts, you're sending them info, you know, about you. And, and if you want to position yourself as an expert, which everybody should do these days in order to get better rankings and conversions, uh, you can kind of manipulate uh, what it is to send those signals out there by by sending people you know a bio that feeds into what you're trying to accomplish so thank you very much for that yes of <laughs> organic, course organic intro <laughs> well i will tell you <clears throat> i i was choking there for a little bit but i got i think i got my composure back um i want to say first and foremost thanks for doing this thanks for jumping on board and and i want to tip my hat to you as well thanks for helping us here at bottleneck uh with your expertise um, we are a client of yours, so I want to disclose that, a disclaimer, whatever you want to say there, um, just to let everybody know that Phil does work with us. But the ideas you shared with us are freaking amazing, and uh, we are so honored 
uh, to work with you. And I just wanted to kind of say that publicly. Thank you uh, for everything you've done, the guidance you've done. The, um, you've just been so kind and awesome to work with. And it just seems like, I don't know what it is, but it seems like we are aligned really well. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make sure that the world knows this uh, because um, it's really important um, when choosing to align yourself with someone, you must align yourself with someone that shares very similar uh, values and, and belief system and stuff like that. And, and in my opinion, we're pretty close there. And I just really appreciate you working with our team and doing all the things that you've done. So um, I just, yeah. All right, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Really <laughs> uh, it is different. I mean, this is a different type of relationship. Uh, because I really believe what you guys are doing at services like yours that have you know, helped us do what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but also it's really important. I mean, people should really be, be and, and when you, when there's that level of, I guess, alignment in what we're doing, it kind of takes the typical, I guess, partnership or maybe, you know, client lifts in a different relationship because, uh, because it's so, uh, you know, involved and in, into, uh, you know, what things that we're doing today. So I'm really, really excited to talk about how, how services like the ones that you have are, are really important for you know, companies like ours, but also, also digital age, but really a lot of different companies. Um, I've actually got another company that, that I want to talk about too later on that, uh, that's basically a home services company that has a service, you know, like yours that's using to grow their business. So, so it is different. I just want to let people know, like, that's one of these things where you do you know, stuff. People want to like improve their presence and work on expertise, expertise, authority, and trust and get, um, uh, to improve their rankings, get more leads and sales, but this is really, really integrated. Um, I think into the back office of what a lot of uh, agencies in, in my kind of world uh, have when they're really successful. So, so you know, now, when you're talking about agencies, you're talking about SEO agencies, marketing agencies, uh, uh, advertising agencies, anybody that's in an agency type environment, correct? I think so. I mean, when I look at it, uh, there's all sorts of specialized digital agents. Anybody's kind of in the digital space, I guess you could expand that out into even other types of, you know, traditional um, advertising. But when I think about agencies in my world, I'm thinking about digital agencies. But that could be people that focus on like content and, and maybe social media or paid um, and and niche agencies. Like we have podcast bookers, and really all they do is try and get people booked on established podcasts and their niche. That's kind of a micro agency. So anything in that space. Um, I think where you're primarily kind of working in, in the digital world is kind of how I, I guess I would position you know, ourselves and, and, and where, I, where I can speak to with a little more authority um, than other types of maybe marketing and advertising companies. Yeah. So, I, um, well, thank you for lining that out because now people listening kind of get that. And get is that me or not? Yeah, exactly. Are we talking? Yeah. Right. So um, one of the things I, I wanted to kind of jump into this, um, you said you had five things you wanted to touch on. But the title is how to create a seven digit EBITDA agency. And I want to I want to maybe touch on this. I was really excited the first time we did over a million dollars. I was really excited. Um, but that was revenue. That wasn't profit. And there's a big difference there. And and that's pretty exciting to say, hey, we generate over a million dollars. That's that and it is, it is a right? significant milestone for sure. But there's a difference mm -hmm. in the how in, in the health of, a, of an organization, in an agency, right? So um, without knowing, I know you want to talk on five things, but can you maybe touch on this a little bit and then kind of share your experience, your real life experience dealing with revenue versus EBITDA? Yeah, that's actually kind of the first point on my little checklist that I had was 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 talking about, I think, how in the agency world, a lot of us um, kind of glorify the revenue number and in a lot of cases, the employee count. And I don't want to dismiss anybody that's growing. So there's a lot of things coming out right now where people have made like Inc. 500 or Inc. 1000 or whatever it is. And that truly is an awesome uh, milestone for anybody, just for small businesses in general, that kind of recognition. Um Profit, profitability, profit margins are not, that's, it's still to be able to go into a market, uh, monetize help in a way where you can grow a business and they pay you for money. Uh, people should be really uh, proud of that because small businesses power other businesses and it's really important for our economy and all that kind of stuff. 
That being said, I think one of the problems, and I, I have a different background than just about every single, well, not every, but most most digital agencies out there. But I, you know, I didn't build my first website till I was 35 years old, so I'm 51 now. But I'm not afraid to like say, you know, say what my age is or anything like that. But I, so I, I came into this with a with a degree in finance. My first job was with uh, kind of as a financial analyst. I was in kind of the venture capital type stuff early. So my point is, I came into this kind of more ROI, I think, focused than. A typical like marketing person would be out of college that's working in graphic design or or marketing or uh, maybe coding and that kind of stuff. So you have a different mentality when you come out. You're trying to start something. So I came in kind of already zeroed in, you know, on profit on profit margins. Um, but I think what ends up happening in the agency world is we tend to glorify revenue counts. And this is not just the agency world, but agency world in, in particular is going to glorify revenue numbers. Hey, we're seven digit or we're ten digit or we're growing like this or it's employees. We're growing. We're we're growing more employees, and that's again another milestone to be able to hire somebody, build a team, that kind of stuff. But those types of things, you know, aren't necessarily like always the healthiest place you want to be, right? Because we want to be able to find a way where we add value and charge people in a way where they pay us, you know, more than what it costs, so we're not just trading dollars with the market and our marketing. So to me, it's always been more impressive, and I say this from a, a more mature standpoint now because my business has changed quite a bit over the last let's say five years or so where i've gone to try to try and optimize and grow my business to actually becoming an acquirer of businesses so i own or co-own four uh different businesses and i just recently acquired you know multi seven digit you know a digital agency as well because i'm trying to grow through acquisition and, and bring some of the things i have that that can raise profitability and improve you know, processes and that kind of stuff in different markets much different viewpoint now in terms of what I see, because some of the companies that I bought, I'll give you two in particular. One was a two and a half million dollar traditional marketing company, more kind of print direct mail, basically a distressed asset um, that had the two and a half million dollars in revenues, but there was basically no money there. So it sounds really awesome to have 15 employees, <laughs> two and a half million dollars in sales and really not be worth anything because it's not making any money or, or less than that. And I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had people contact me. You know, I'm not an influencer in the space like other people are that really spend a lot of time and stuff. But I do have a, a, a smaller community of people I think do probably follow me and some of the things that I say. And I've talked to or had side conversations with dozens you know, of agency owners. And you'd be surprised how many have multi-million dollar businesses, um, but maybe only net. We talk about EBITDA, we're talking about earnings. Um, before interest, depreciation, tax, and amortization, which is really kind of the net profit that you break together. I think of it just in terms of what you actually take home. So I've talked to companies that are $3 million agencies, $5 million agencies, and some of the guys, you know, but the one before that was like had their first distribution after like five years. Um, another one, maybe $3 million bringing home $300,000, which is, I mean, so, so some of the things are like, that's great. If you're a $3 million comp agency and you're netting as an owner 300,000 a lot of people that are listening to me aren't agency owners they'll be like that sounds pretty incredible right um but the you got to think about different things that are happening here right where uh maybe there's a partner involved and that ends up becoming 150,000 uh the other part of it is is that the actual maximum potential you can make as an as an agency if you implement other things can you be is is is, is, is a ten percent net margin you know across peers or whatever? Is that really something that would be you know sexy or attractive or can you do better? Now, as somebody who is actively looking to acquire agencies and grow my business substantially through acquisitions, I've seen a lot of agencies now come to me um, through sources where I look at and I can see where a lot of agencies are that are looking to exit are. And, you know, a good solid margin, I think, for some of these companies is usually going to be somewhere between like 15 and 25 percent. That's what I'm seeing. And then the people are going to end up getting maybe three and a half, four times that because they've got a recurring revenue base. Right. If you make five hundred thousand, make five hundred thousand dollars a year, you may be able to sell for like two million. Uh, if you've got once you get over like the million dollar EBITDA mark, the multiples start to go up, you know, especially after five million and ten million go up even a lot higher than that. Um, which is really what I'm trying to do is over the next five to 10 years is build something that's, that's, that's a lot larger. But my point is that you, you should really try and be kind of in that 20 to 25% range, which is I think attainable and a good solid margin, you know, for an agency that actually has a team, 
You always see other types of people that'll build agencies and be like a one person or two man show. Those guys can be, and you got there can be really profitable if you're doing all the work. But when it starts to get to where you actually have a team and you can start scaling stuff off and growing, you know, a 20, 20%, 25% minus is pretty good. Now, is that where you can be to really explode? No. No, I'm telling you firsthand, you can get the 30, you can get the 40, you can get the 50% margin if you set up your company the right way and move away from what I would consider like an old school agency mentality and move into one where you can really try and figure out ways to leverage growth and do, um, I, I look at things like this. If you're an expert or you really can add value to somebody, you're really looking to try and figure out what can you do to spend the least amount of time in that provides the most amount of value. And that's when you can really crush it and get margins beyond your wildest dreams. Totally attainable, totally doable. So that's the first thing I would say you need to know, folks, I'm just going to rehash that first thing is let's focus on, on profit, you know, um, as much or more than we do on, on revenues and employee growth. Because when you go to like, say you want to position yourself for an exit, which everybody should really be thinking about at some point. From day not, one. And from, from day, day one. Should, you should be uh, right from day one. Exactly. Agree. If you're not doing that, you're, 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 you're fit. You're, you don't know where the finish line is. <laughs> Even yep. if you don't think you have plans to do it, um, you really need to position yourself and you have to know where, go ahead. So, so this, this, this thing that keeps popping in my mind, and this might be uh, a hood ornament, meaning I'm speaking before I should be because number two might be this or some three, four, five. Um, building, building a company to scale for growth. Um, we did generate a certain level of income. When I say we, I'm talking about two or three people. We decided to build the infrastructure meaning the systems, the processes, the personnel, the team members, we decided to build that in order to scale. So our profitability dropped way off, right? With, with plans of going, okay, this is what we need to do and this is where we're gonna get to, but now we have the infrastructure. Now I did that maybe backwards than a lot of, a lot of other people would have done. They would have really built the business up and then slowly added to it. But I wanted to make sure that we were all set to go with all of this. And so I maybe took the harder route, right? But at the same time, I now have the confidence to scale because the infrastructure is set, right? As far as the team and the, the processes for each person's role and their responsibilities and how we can manage, you know, bringing on more clients. So I wonder, was this a hood ornament? Are you going to talk about systems, processes, anything like that? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Uh, this really gets to be an interesting question about, and this is kind of, it does flow into kind of what I'm talking about to some degree. And it really comes into like how I've been looking at as an acquirer of agencies, how businesses are set up because some of the times, and I don't know where this part of this process where I should talk about it, but there's certain things where you need to process size your business and take everything as to what's all written out. But getting everything documented and processed doesn't necessarily mean that it's optimized. Okay. Well, that so takes if, time, I would think too, and experience, right? Right. But I, one of the things I've noticed, in fact, with the agency that I built, I'm, they're just bought um, much better systemized process, I think than we, we had, or we were getting, but it's not optimized. Does that make sense? Like to where, so if you start scaling a system that's very well and, and runs like a well-oiled machine, but there's redundancies in it, then you're scaling at a lower profitable rate because you haven't extracted the repeatable stuff out and left the smart creative stuff in it. A lot of people, a lot of agencies are stuck in that right now. They're hiring and scaling at an expensive rate of people where they're, they're not using the right people because they're underutilizing their talent, maybe say here, where some of the stuff should be pulled out of what they're doing and done by maybe another team. And that's how you get explosive profitability growth. And I see this all the time. In fact, the first one was revenue and employee versus EBITDA. The other part of it, I'm going to get through that. I got like kind of the system here, but it's definitely one of these points. I'm going to repeat a little bit of that in a second. Okay. Um, but I had kind of a process that I went through this. So, so yes. I love process. <laughs> oh, totally. And it kind of feeds into how you've done it. And just to answer your one question, um, I've done things the opposite way and there's different ways to skin a cat, but I've always kind of been like, and this is, depends on kind of like your level of 
stress and how much you like to do things. And, you know, I'm a person that probably has a little attention deficit. So I have to be working all the time to feel comfortable. So I'm comfortable probably with a higher level of doggy paddling. Yeah. Where some people aren't. And that just is a different type of, you know, what makes you fulfilled and, and you know, happy and, and, and reduces stress in your life. Um, so what I want to get in the second part of it is as an agency of anybody, you really want to sell like a process or a productized version of your, of your service, really. Okay. Um, and this gets into how I think we're very different from a lot of the agencies that I've seen to acquire, but also ones that we compete against. Okay. And here's the, here's the main difference about how, what, how we are and how we're different and actually how we differentiate ourselves a little bit. So what I see a lot in the agency world is they they tend to have, uh, whether it's a content management marketing firm or a social media firm, or even to some degree, like some degree, like SEO and, and other types of you know, holistic marketing is they tend to be very account management heavy. Owner, maybe owners on the sales side are kind of doing some of the management, maybe 10 account managers and like one or two technicians. Maybe an SEO person, maybe a PPC person, maybe a developer. Some maybe have more or less. But what do you end up having is you get this high contact and this high level of weekly meetings or a lot of communication from people that really don't have the answers to stuff. Okay. And then they got to go in the back office and fight and find like, how do we do that? Who's going to do the work on this part of it? What's the answer to the SEO question type of deal? There's a lot of like businesses out there probably realize that. Say so we do meet like once a week or every month, but it seems like we're kind of going over you know, old reports or stuff like that, or we're not really, and then the answers always have to, someone's got to follow up and find somebody else who has the answer. Then those guys are competing. The account managers are kind of competing to find who does got the answer to the question type of thing. So this is a very typical like agency setup that I've seen where it's very account driven, lots of very talented people. They probably could be doing other things and they're not really like, so, so I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get is our agency is like the complete opposite. We have basically zero account managers and all technicians. Now, the weakness of the problem with that is um, you have to be able to educate a business uh, owner and that this is what you're getting. You're getting people that are actually in the game and the talent playing with it. A lot less handholding, a lot more work being done, a systemized approach. We're going to do it this way. We customize things where there's a routine. This work's going to come in this way through this system and it's going to be done in and out every week. And we're going to show you via, hey, this is kind of where we look. We look a lot to Google Search Console to show people impressions and growth in our case. And then we also want to pin down the beginning, hey, let's look at the leads and the qualified things that come in. Those are the two things that really matter. I don't care if you got 2 million impressions or lots of engagement. I really want to show $2 million in the bank. That's what we want, right? So let's focus on where it is and then spend less time with the account management and the fluffy communication stuff and more time actually doing the work and implementing a high ROI system. So that yep. takes a little different approach too, and having the right people in the right areas and being able to do- When you say ROS system, can you please- uh... I, said, I said, I meant ROI, sorry, ROI. ROI, okay. High <laughs> ROI system, okay. so thank you for that. That's kind of an important <laughs> important abbreviation there. So so what that gets to as an agency is, you know, you know, focus on that, I think has been our approach to really try to raise things up because account management, especially when you're doing all stuff here, maybe local or domestically and somebody that's getting talented is an expensive resource. If it's just about a communication and management and not about actually getting work done. Um, the other problem I see a lot of agencies that they have is they're not, since they're not focusing maybe on the actual return on investment, the leads, the traffic, the sales and the ranks, that kind of stuff. Um, they focus on basically selling the ingredients and not the system or the strategies. This is getting mm. back into John Jan stuff and things like that. Um, but you really need to be, thinking about selling and creating a productized system where somebody's buying a product from you versus you selling a consulting service that's a lot of time intensive type stuff and more handholding and, and lots of things that actually are fluffy and sizzle, but not the actual meal. Very important, I think, for an agency to be able to do this because that's how you can increase your margins and actually increase the results for your clients because it aligns everything up. So remove the low value reporting and communication stuff. And a lot of agents are like, yes, that sucks. We hate that. And then turn it over into like, how do we show the clients where their stuff is and kind of let us do our thing. And if you are going to meet about stuff, spend less time talking about the past and more time talking about what's in front of you. Lots of stuff to do in marketing, lots of ways to finish this system. Let's work on continuing to eat the elephant and growing this platform out. So it continues to kind of snowball and grow on itself. 
So that's the part is you know, system, but, but to have a system, you got to have the right resources in place and you really yep. got to make sure. That, go ahead. So we're going to get to like the final point really is going to draw a lot of this together, but that's well, and, I, but approach I, is important. and I want to, I'm going to touch on that really quick too, because, um, you know, you and I've, I've, I've gone after the business in a, in a little bit of a different way. We share similar core values, beliefs, things like that, but we've done things differently. And, and one of the things that is really important is getting stuff that's in my head out. I don't care if you have one person or zero people or 30 people or 500 people. It all starts with you as the agency owner that needs to get your creative ideas or your creative process out and documented in a certain way. Because before you ever start with day one, you're planning your exit strategy, but day one, you should also be planning your hiring or your growth strategy. Day one should start there. And, and over time, based on experience, based on what you've learned, data input from clients and friction points and where you drop the ball and how to improve this process and this, that all comes with experience, but you need that foundation. And if you keep, keep all of it up in your brain, it reduces the amount of creativity that will be allowed to roam around up there. And so I just wanted to, because you had kind of touched and skirted around that, but I just wanted to nail that one home because that is so important. Now you will create that foundation and you will constantly need to be updating it. But if you don't start somewhere, Record on video what you do. Uh, write it down step by step. What it doesn't matter. Get it out onto some form, or some medium, so that at a certain point in time, this process can be either delegated or it can be documented in a certain way. That will help your value on exit, and that will also help you scale your business um, and help with communication. Thousand percent. I mean, I couldn't have said any better. And that's just a core key component. Yeah. Uh, this thing. So the third thing I was going to come up with was do what you sell. I mean, that's a really great way to close people and show that it works. And so some people don't necessarily do this in in our space. Like they'll come in and I call I've been calling recently like, you know, you may be Patrick Mahomes, but your clients need Andy Reid. Right. So you'll see people out there in social media that they're on this um, almost like this hamster wheel of creating lots of content, doing stuff. And you're not going to be them. You're not, you're just not going to be them. You don't have the time to do it as a business owner. A lot of times agencies don't have, that's great if that's the way they found it. Um, but you don't hire those people to kind of emulate that part of it because you're not going to be able to do that. So in our situation, what we do is like, I'm actually trying to do like, what's the least amount of time I can spend and get the most amount of clients. You know, in our case, just here, our agency here, I've had the, we've had the biggest month we've ever had. Um, and I don't, people are seeing less of me because I'm really trying to be more deliberate about doing the stuff that I believe in that works. And I happen to believe like social media is a great platform to get your message and things out, but it can be overdone and there's diminishing returns on it. And if you're not really selling that, if you get too much on like one platform or stuff, things and that, and you're trying to sell, I'm going to do what I'm doing for you on this one platform, your clients aren't going to get the best results. So, and, I, and a lot of people do this. Like though, I know SEO guys that are out there that run pretty big businesses and they're selling SEO, but they're, they're doing outbound calls, right? So they're not even really, or they're selling SEO and most of their clients are coming from Facebook. Well, are you really that? I think that and that's great. And they probably make a pretty, but you're going to, if you want to maximize, I'm talking about not go the 10 to 20, maybe 30. If you want to go to 40, 50 or 60, it really does help it if you come in and do the system and show the people the way it works for you, um, the what you're going to sell that. So I really firmly believe in that. And we've really kind of, you know, doubled and tripled down, you know, on that piece of it. And it, it, it really does, you know, kind of work again, 2 million impressions on LinkedIn isn't the same as $2 million in the bank, honestly. Right. And I think people really need to focus on it because it kind of gets back to that revenue employee engagement numbers, all these vanity things, where if you flip it over, I think you and I were talking about this, that fastest growing company list on revenues or maybe employee growth would look a lot different if it was fastest and most amount of profit list. It would be a totally different set of companies. Now, if there are some that are on, those are the truly diamond platinum and crested unicorns that are out there. And there are some, believe me. And, and you know, some of the things that we do is different than like, you know, a growth in like maybe an, a SaaS business or a Silicon Valley, different, different set of like, you know, uh, valuations and things like that. For most of us on Main Street in the agency world, you know, we're kind of working with more practical cash flow numbers and profits yeah. and that kind of stuff. So very important there. 
The fourth thing, and this really gets into kind of stuff that you do and how we're cooperating, really is to focus on the right clients. Okay. Because building a system creates big results, but you have to find a client that's willing to invest in a system to get those results. Because some of the times a system takes a long time to roll out and build on each other. Right. So, but there's a lot of folks that go out there and just, if you're not really, if you're not, don't really have a client that's, that believes in the kind of the strategy and the strategic approach of, of what you're doing, and they're just more focused on like short term stuff or how much time that you're spending, they're not going to be a good client for you. And then you're going to spend, you're not going to be able to be as profitable as you could be on somebody that doesn't share that value in that thing. So how we do that, and that, that a lot of that comes into like not taking the time, not wanting to take the time. Um, in for short term leads, not, you know, not, not kind of focus on this one. They might say, we understand it takes a long time. I don't really believe in that. So how we've gotten around that. And again, not every agency is going to be the same on this, but how we've gotten around that. And really, I think um, been able to grow fast, but also very profitably is to work, try and work with the people that want to be the 800 pound gorilla. They have to want to go out there and grow they have to want to go out there and reach their full potential because they like when people come to us and they want to be like, we just want to do better or this is great. We're going to get 10 times return. I want people that want two, three, four, five times return over time, really scale their business. And they're worried about not reaching their potential, not growing just five or 10% or whatever it is to get a little bit of return. So if you align yourself with the clients that really believe in that, they're going to want to do the work to build that influencer status, that EAT stuff that really makes the huge difference. Because at the end of the day, we all want to buy from the guy that comes out and sounds confident, knows what he's doing, comes out and does that stuff and be like that and be, I don't, I don't sleep at night because not because we're, we're not really profitable. I still, I only sleep at night because I'm like, could I be doing better? Is this the best I can do with what I want to do? And when you find clients like that, who really believe in that, and they're just like, I want to be the 800 pound gorilla. I really want to reach my maximum potential. Those are the ones that are going to stick with you. Those are the ones that are going to be the most long-term. Those are the ones that are going to be the most profitable. So that means sometimes building your lead system up and saying no a lot and sticking, you know, 80 clients that really believe in really profitable are better than 800 clients that are a pain and don't believe in stuff and you're fighting, you're getting low margin on. That's a huge, huge thing. And a lot of people probably out there that are listening are like, yes, I understand that part of, but it's hard to say no to people too, when you're trying to grow. So Yep. But it's that also into the fifth point. important to say, too, the people that, that pay you, you know, and haggle over every nickel and dime, those are usually your tougher clients, as well as the people that say, this is your rate. OK, I'll pay you my rate. Let's do this. Let's go to town. Those are usually the people that you get along with a lot better as well, in my experience. 100 percent. And it really comes back to, like, do you buy into the strategy? Do you look at this long term? Do you understand you're trying to build your own platform? So stuff will come. It doesn't matter really what it is, but you got to give it enough time to roll out so that people can truly reach their potential. And are you going to participate? I mean, some of the stuff that we're doing these days, it's a little bit more than writing a check and you have to find creative ways to get your client to get little bits of time and add lots of value. Again, it's the same thing we're all trying to do, right? Can't have a system that comes up that's really time intensive for a client because they're not. But if you can find different ways to like, in our case, we go out and video once a quarter. And ask hey, questions. Hey, Great, great way to get that kind of stuff. So I can talk about that process maybe another time, but that, that's kind of another thing. Hey, get key to profitability, key to really growing, key to get that stuff is really, really, really focusing and doubling down on the best possible clients. In our case, it's really going after the people that truly want to grow and are afraid to not reach their potential, basically. The fifth thing, this is, I think, one of the most important things, okay? <laughs> this is how I will throttle any agency in the country um, that's not doing this. OK, and that is you have to be able to outsource your labor intensive digital work somewhere else if you want to get the most out of your team that's maybe you know local to you um, and the ones that are talented and really spend the people that are maybe in, in that part of what you're doing, get the, get the most amount of, of talent and best possible work out of them. So in our case that I, I don't know if I've explained too much of my background on this part, but you know, I spent. 10 years in Asia. I ran a software company in Taiwan. Um, my wife's from Taiwan. Um, I have a lot of experience working with software and other types of digital stuff in Europe, in um, all over Asia, uh, India, Bangladesh, and the Philippines. So what I've come to my conclusion is that in our case, um, one of the best places to outsource digital work has been in the Philippines, right? And I'm gonna to get to some, there's all other places you can do that. So if you have talented partners, that's great. 
in our case, we found, I think, the best possible place to go is in the Philippines. Now, what's really important about uh, having a back office in another location, I think, one is actually to be in another time zone, okay? Uh, because in our, what happens at our agency is we do stuff and we do stuff and we try and kick butt all day long. End of the day, we ticket stuff up, goes to our remote team who has a systemized approach. By the time we wake up the next morning, that work is done. So shadow agency makes me twice as productive as just about every other agency that's not doing this. Okay. But here's the important part of being able to outsource some of your work is, and this is why I failed. And this is where if you don't have a company like yours, if you try and outsource to the wrong company, you will have a nightmare like you've never imagined. It will cause you stress. You will lose sleep. It will damage things. It can actually ruin client relationships. It can also be the best thing that you ever do and puts you on the path to 40, 50, 60% net margin agency. So I'm going to learn, I'm going to explain to you why having a partner to help you get the right types of people to build that team is like the only way to do it successfully. But in my case, when we first tried it, we were like, hey, this is cool. We'll have our agency and our people, and then we'll figure out a way to kind of replicate what this person does here over there. Okay. And that didn't work at all. Uh, what, what ends up happening is you do need, in my opinion, need to processize your stuff and step everything out. But after you process everything out, you also need to optimize. And this is really important. It gets back to that first point that we, we talked about before is just because you have a process, just because it is documented, does not mean it's the best process for your agency. So during that point, you need to go out and figure, is this the best thing? Maybe we should actually batch and remove certain things. So our problem a lot of times in the beginning, let's just give SEO for an example, is we were trying to outsource some of like the SEO tasks that we had, but it was hard because some of those tasks required a level of SEO or maybe even maybe English or maybe even cultural knowledge that was hard to transfer. So we actually changed our process to be like, hey, let's let's put some of this on, on our writers and our editors so that when we give this portion, the tasks are much easier to do. And now we've optimized our process and been like, wow, that actually one little thing by optimizing our process was an absolute game changer. And then we found other ways to game change stuff. So part of this is really not just about documenting and not just about putting out because that's one step. And every agency does that and is probably think doing that. But just because you have a system, just because it works, doesn't mean that it's optimized. And it doesn't mean that you're looking for ways to find the best use of maybe say your local agency talents that's client facing and the ones that you're using in the back end. Some people probably have figured this out. Very big struggle, you know, for us. But once we did that, we've had huge gains and we continue to have huge gains as we stay focused on optimization. And what I will say is um, as soon as you figure that out, because of technology or client demands or different things happening in the world, it's a it, it's a constant touch point. Right. And and for many people, this is extremely challenging because it's it's time since, you know, it's 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 a time investment. But there becomes a certain amount of a certain point in time where the updates or the, the optimizations of this uh, of your foundational process can be delegated, can be done by somebody else. Uh, in my case, it took almost four years. But there's a point in time now where our now director of operations, who was once my personal assistant, now runs the documentation process for us. So I get to spend my time focusing on the creativity and learning about new technology and meeting Phil Singleton and doing stuff like that. Wherein it, But it wasn't always that, that time. And there was a time where I spent a lot of time working on that. Yes. And that's where I say people, have, you've probably heard this. I found fail yeah. points. You have to remove yeah. the fail points. It's not working, but where is it not working? It's not working. Exactly. Right. I found somebody to be able to look at that. Right. And, and th that just shows the, how unbelievable people are once they understand that vision, but it wasn't always like that. And I just not saying that you need to work on your business, not in your business. Hmm. Yes, but no. Right, 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 <laughs> you right, right. Need to be in your business, doing, setting this stuff up, and because you're the one that can figure this stuff out. Like you said, there's cultural differences. There may be this over there, which can be trained over time to someone else. 
But this is it's your like agency. You said, it came out exactly. It came out of your brain. All the stuff that they're doing is your process, you know, type of the thing. So when it changes or you come up with something better, you need to be able to do that and optimize it. It's constantly be looking for better ways and not giving up when something seems like it's tough. There are ways to figure so that's all we do in businesses. We are we we monetize help, right? So we need to figure out a way to help ourselves to be able to figure out how this is going to fix a problem and reduce stress for our team. So your team, remote team knows what it's doing. It's clear. They don't want to fail on their pieces and you make better use of your local team, which might be more focused on maybe the creative, the talent, the discussions that extract stuff from your clients so that you can turn stuff around. Total and utter game changer. Here's the issue though, with building that remote team is a lot of people maybe have tried it. So, you know what? I tried to do that and it was a disaster. I tried to do that and it didn't work. And if you don't do it the right, it, it, it can be, it is. I'm going to tell you firsthand, like the first couple of times we tried to hire remotely, I mean, I, very not successful in Bangladesh, not successful in India for anything. Philippines, same deal. And I was like, what is going on? I can't even do Some people have it. And the problem is, is you, you, you don't, you don't, there's just so many places to go where you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to vet. You don't, I and mean, one of the things that you guys pitch over at, at bottleneck is dedicated, you know, distant assistance. The dedicated piece to me is the most important thing there is because the problem that we've had and a lot of people I think have is they'll go to like job sites and stuff and try and hire people. And a lot of those folks are, I don't want to say scam, but there are a lot of people out there are looking for multiple full-time jobs and they're not really dedicated and they're just trying to kind of get a stream of churn and burn. And it's really more common than you think in some of these places where some of us on the outside are looking to come in. So unless you have somebody that's an expert that can go in and find somebody and vet them and understand that they're um, trained and then also come in and do some level of training so that it minimizes the risk of you. Because what ends up happening if you don't have a plan set up like I have, and this is, I know, saying a million, many times over, but first person I hired, I went in and I had an enormous amount of stress on me because I didn't have anything documented. And I had this person I was paying for, I was constantly asking like, what can I do? Can I do this? And and it was it actually created more stress and more headache. And I was like, this is a nightmare. Trying to hire somebody for help is a nightmare because I didn't have them vetted. I didn't have them trained. I didn't have a process even for them to begin on. So it actually made it worse. You know, well, I, there's something to be said for that, too, because anytime you hire somebody, your life is going to get significantly more challenging at least for the you know first 60 days. First and we know that's just hiring anybody, right? It, exactly, exactly. But but a lot of people don't expect that. They want to hire the rock star. They want to hire somebody that knows how to do everything. The challenge is if you hire somebody that already knows how to do everything, what if they know how to do everything and it's not the way you want it done? Right. Right? So there's there's a lot of stuff that goes on um, in, in, in that initial process especially in fast paced agency type environments, um, you have to have a plan in place for this. And that's why I say, start planning for your exit on day one and start planning for your hiring on day one. Right. Because you have to come in with a game plan. I, um, I do want to impress on people on this point though, how important it is for you to be able to take parts of your process in a way that a remote person that has English as, I guess you call it second or first. I mean, the in the Philippines is very great. You call it na native or semi-native in a lot of cases, but it's still something where it's so valuable to you to be able to put that work that can be like stepified and have somebody go in and do that level of like, almost like labor for you on, a, on that part of it um, is will open your eyes basically. Yep. And help you be like, how can we do things differently? Because, and one of the things you and I have talked about in the past is like, what is the optimal you know, amount? You said, well, everybody maybe should start out at a minimum of like 10% remote helpers. I think the optimal, because I've done this a lot and I've tried, I think it's actually 50%. I like to have my guys here with 50% remote so that we've got a shadow. I, I agree with you. I'm 100%, here. but people, I, I think it's people, hard to get started. Yeah, right. But when people get started, they, it's kind of, it's 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 not as it's not as difficult. By the way, you're speaking about the 10% rule, meaning I believe every single organization agency should have 10% minimum of their workforce remote to Great save start. on overhead and increase pro productivity. I'm gonna tell you from an agency level, if you're at if you're at 50%, that gets you to profit margins you didn't think were possible. Oh, I guarantee that. And I'm not talking about a million, I'm talking about multi-million dollar agency getting to 40, 50 percent plus margins. That's a key component to do it. And, and there's so many reasons. It's not just the cost savings. It's the, there is a cost savings there. 
there is a part of extracting, like I was saying, the talent you have here is doing different things. They have more time to do. You're getting more out of them. You're pouring this out of here. Then they're actually working while you're sleeping is just people don't realize how like I'm, I'm twice as fast because I wake up to work that didn't get done yesterday. Yeah. It's just, I, just goes on. Um, Gordon McDougall, you know, Gordon from LinkedIn said, you mentioned that you love working with bottleneck. What is it about bottleneck that you love? I think it's really like, I think about the nightmare of how you know people might hear me say that and they're going to be like, it's like anything. Like when I come out and I tell people you need to be doing all these things. And what I give them is a list of ingredients and the ingredients is not a recipe. Um, you have a recipe, right? I can go get the ingredients and then I will fail because I don't know how to cook them. So that's really what's important. I think with bottleneck is you guys are coming in and understand like the fail point of building a remote team is high because you don't have the expertise and like you guys come in and you recruit and you train and you're looking for people with the right personalities and the fact that they're dedicated that's hard for us outside of that your knowledge of expertise to be able to find those people and that's really invaluable because i can tell you somebody who's done it on their own it's really hard it is the payback is huge but to get started without the proper help. And that's what that's why I love bottleneck is you guys have come in. That's why we were like, I was like, oh my God, it's like people, agencies should be contacting you now and listening to what I'm saying. You're a 10% margin, you're a 20% margin. You need to contact Jamie today and start building this team. And you can really get to that margin. If you're not doing that and you're having your local team do all that kind of stuff, you're 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 just not gonna reach your full potential. I just guarantee it's not gonna happen. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, this is one of the, you know, five key points I mentioned. This is probably one of the most important points. And even if for nothing else, it forces you to extract and processize things that are repeatable and that you shouldn't be spending on maybe the team here and get them to focus on things that are more building and more focused, customer focused, so they can start making them the hero in the journey, you know, instead of working on the stuff that's keeping them back from maybe, you know, using their talent in other areas. Total total game changer. Um, some of the stuff, it's like, I'm at the point now in my career where I like, I was, I don't want to tell everybody all this stuff. And now I'm like, Shit, man, it, it's, there's enough people out there that w need help. We know we're getting a lot of people that need help right now. You can help and grow your business and help other businesses by working on this part and being, you know, being committed to do it. Don't give up. It's not like I say something it's like, oh, you know, obviously even the stuff that you do, Jamie, takes some time to take. Well, it's like anybody. We do SEO. You got to have it. Give some time to roll out. It's not going to be like, you know, just rain and stuff from day one and, you know, unicorns. No, it takes time. Rainbows. Yeah, there's going to be. But you minimize the amount of nightmare. But, but you're looking at as opposed to cost. This is how I look at it. Instead of cost, I'm looking at investing. I'm looking at investing because no matter what next year is going to come. <laughs> most likely, right? Where where am I going to position myself so that I'm in the best position possible next year? Well, I have to take action now um, to do the things that I want to be able to do in my future. Why do people save money, <laughs> right? right? Maybe they start a, a college fund for their baby who's going to be in college in 19, 20 years, but they start now because that's how you build your future, right? right? right. And so investing in this stuff, in, in my opinion, is Huge. how to look at it. You're investing. That is an investment. And a lot of people just don't think this way. We're like, how, by, you have to, as an agency, be able to have a process. You can hire somebody soon or hire somebody remotely and be able to put them with a reasonable amount of time to be able to do your stuff. If you haven't done that yet, if you don't have a systemized approach where you couldn't, you can't bring that and extract that from your business and have somebody do it in a way that adds value. It's you're not going to get the efficiencies out of your business in particular in agency. I can tell you this is an absolute game changer, um, different way to look at things. And it's again, and then it enables you to scale at that rate. You know, it's like, yeah, you yep. still need to buy this here. It's not like you're going to, and it's not like you're trying to have somebody do stuff. It's more like a support thing. Your customers are going to get way better support. We've got a support system set up that goes from, you know, me strategy down to kind of our tiers and some of the things go straight to them and they're just done automatically because we've got a process. You, oh my gosh. That, and that takes some time <laughs> off of, again, the account management type stuff because it's going directly to the people who can fix it and it's done before they wake up the next morning. So it's a two pronged approach. I would never say, Hey, try and build a one person agency and an entire, you know, remote staff. It's just, 
in a different, it's not going to, it's not going to work. You need to have the talent, but the talent you have here has to be the talent. And that's where your, most of your money is, is the, in extracting the talent and taking the low value stuff off of their plate so they can really add, and that's the stuff they want to do anyway, by the way. Focusing on their best work. Right, <laughs> right, right. And taking the kind of the redundant, repeatable stuff out. So, so that's, it's just well, a huge thing. And it's not, I totally believe in this. It's like me trying to like, okay, you do this, but it's true. And this is the thing I would tell people to do it later, but then I still go do this and they, it doesn't work and it fails. It speaks fail because there's, you don't have a, a guide in the middle that can help yep. you minimize the wrong choice. And that's, I think, Absolutely. the shortcut you know, to what you guys you know, are doing for people, which is why I'm excited to talk about it. Well, thank you, Phil. We got to wrap this thing up. I went way over your time on this. <laughs> and, and, and I want to respect your time because I know you have a lot of things going on, but it just shows your passion for this. And I can't thank you. I really it. believe it. You know that, though. Um, so how, how do people reach out to you? Um, you know, I, if I do anything, I do try and minimize any stuff on social media, but I am somewhat active. I, mean, I check LinkedIn at least once a day. Um, that'd be the best place to kind of reach out and connect. And, you know, we are rebuilding our website and doing that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm going to start, you know, practicing what I've heard. We've had since COVID, I pulled back on marketing because we just had a lot coming in without having to do a bunch of stuff. But contact me on LinkedIn and you can reach out to our website if you want to find out anything where we are making some changes. But uh, I'm always happy to help and share stuff with any agency owner that wants to, like, you know, know some of the nuts and bolts of kind of what oh. we're I just noticed your LinkedIn uh, was wrong here. It said it says LinkedIn.com feed. It's uh -oh. what's your? Do you know what your LinkedIn is? Uh, I think it's. I want to put uh, it up there. I think. Uh, I think here I'll, I can get it real fast. I, can't, I, I for I, years. I think it's some cheesy SEO thing. It's like Kansas City SEO or SEO Kansas City. Oh, it is. It is. Okay, let me put this on. Yeah. there. it's SEO yeah. Kansas City. Yeah. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. There we go. Save. There it is. In SEO Kansas City. So it just said feed on there. My, my bad. That's the that's the twenty years SEO back in the day. Oh, keywords, yeah. keywords, specific, exact match keywords. So. You know, anchor text, long tail. <laughs> it's changed quite a bit now, but um, you know, so you still got some legacy stuff out there. Just like you have some people still named triple a this and that from the yellow pages right? yeah right <laughs> now seo's kind of got it's like aged you know type thing. you know that's all right man always love talking to you man maybe we can kind of you know expound you're on amazing thank you so much um you guys love it. just real quick and i'll wrap up just real quick yep okay let me do this uh i just want to say thank you uh again to phil um he's the founder and ceo of kansas city web design you got to go check out his website kcwebdesigner.com or kcseopro.com uh here's his email here phil at kcwebdesigner.com and of course we just talked about linkedin there um go check out his book at podcastbookers.com um and uh he's, it's just an incredible conversation i cannot recommend doing work now getting in with phil is is not easy uh but if you get an opportunity to work with him I cannot recommend it enough. He gets it. I, I'm telling you, he gets it. Um, so let me go ahead and wrap up today. Um, if you want to check things out and learn how you can break through the bottleneck in your business today, you can go to bottleneck.online slash bottleneck television, BTV. Um, also, if you haven't already picked it up, go to quitrepeatingyourself.com, my new book, How Today's Leaders Are Using Systems and Processes to Grow Their Business the Right Way. By the way, August 27th will be my one-year anniversary for that. Uh, so I'm pretty pumped up. Today, we've been talking to Phil Singleton, the founder and CEO of Kansas City Web Design and SEO, how to create a seven-digit EBITDA agency. We're not talking revenue here. And uh, previously, I talked with Christian Murdy. Uh, we talked about sales marketing. And coming soon to your earbuds, we're going to be talking about Ian Robinson renewing B2B operations through custom software in the age of SaaS. It's coming up Wednesday, August 24th. Really look forward to uh, that conversation. Again, thank you so much, Phil Singleton. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. And don't forget, create your own ripple. We'll talk to you soon.